Welcome to Oracle Developer Live, Java Innovations. My name is Sharath Chander, and I'm happy to be your host again. As we've done every six months, we have another Java edition of this event. And today, we've decided to come out of the studio and go a little unplugged. And we're lucky enough to be in one of the locations where Java innovation happens here in our Santa Clara office. And I'm lucky enough to have three of our leaders that lead Java forward. I'm lucky enough to have George Saab, Vice President, Java Platform Group, and Chair of the OpenJDK Governing Board, Chad Aramura, Vice President, Java Developer Relations, and Aurelio Garcia Ribeiro, Senior Director, Java Platform Group. So we have a lot of questions that have been coming in over the last six months. And we figured, you know what? Let's just get to your questions and see where Java is moving in the future. You know, I'd like to start off with something that many of us have been wondering, which is Java has been around for 27 years. And it seems like a long time, but really it just goes by in a flash uh, of, of a wink. And I thought, Maybe we can start with you, George. What's kept Java going for 27 years? Well, thanks, Shar. It's certainly uh, an exciting milestone for us. Um, I, I think that you know Java became popular because it was a great alternative that helped people solve problems. And uh, I think that our dedication to continuing to move the underlying technology forward and make the investments that people have made in learning Java, writing Java programs, um, learning and building Java tools has really stood us in good stead. So, you know, time and again, the investment that people's made has turned out to be even uh, more valuable as we moved the underlying platform along and gave it new capabilities or brought it to new platforms uh, that extended those developers' reach. Chad, you had some perspective on this too. You, you know, you've been having an opportunity to talk to a lot of developers uh, over the last three years since you've been with the team. I know that might not seem like a long time, but you're a seasoned veteran now. What's your perspective on what's been sort of the heartbeat for Java? Well, since I've joined, we've been talking a lot about these notions of trust, innovation, and predictability. And I think a big part of Java's success that I've observed over the past couple of years is that we've built trust with the ecosystem by really setting out and making promises and then fulfilling on those promises. Um, so for example, a lot of the things we'll talk about today with Java 19 is all about saying that we're gonna do something, committing to it, and then going out and actually doing it. And that's a big part of building trust with the ecosystem. Um, and then innovation, of course, is all the great stuff that's coming with each release, uh, but not just sort of at random, but doing something that feels like Java, that's not bolted on the side, and that really addresses problems that developers have and thinking through what the problems of tomorrow are. And then predictability, just doing it like clockwork every six months, making sure that we're getting out in front of those releases and doing them, uh, producing high quality builds. So you, you touched upon a lot of areas I think uh, many developers have questions around. One is, you know, I'm an enterprise, I've been using Java for maybe 27 years, or I'm new. And so there's this sort of dichotomy of predictability and stability, but also innovation. How do we balance that, Aurelio? Well, I think one of the reasons that Java has done so great is that we have this almost fanatical dedication to backward compatibility, and we always struggle to not jump in to a feature that seems shiny and bright, but take the time to do it right. One of the best uh, compliments that we can pay to our developers is that when new features come around, people look at them and say, well, this wasn't such a big deal. It feels natural. It looks as if it had always been part of the platform. And it's, it's, you know, it surprised me the amount of work that goes into making things seem so completely seamless. To me, the value of Java is that if you use Java as your platform, it seems as if the world is not moving at a rapid speed because Java will handle a lot of the complexity behind the scenes. You wrote an application, applications written for Java 1 run now and they run significantly faster, significantly better. They take advantage of new processors, but they run unchanged. And achieving that is, is I, I don't think there's anything else out there that could do that. I think that's the, the magic dust in Java, right? 
you said uh, you said magic. I think you know a lot of developers think that uh, oh my god, there must be magic behind the scenes. But a lot of what uh, we do in terms of bringing Java forward is is really transparent and seamless. George, where does all of that magic happen? Well, you know, uh, the magic uh, happens um, in open projects in the Open JDK community, um, which is something that was you know started many years ago by Sun, continued and expanded on by Oracle. Um, we've been very open and transparent in the work that we do. So for Java developers, this is an amazing resource. You can go and look at uh, all of the design discussions as they're happening. You can take part. Um, you can try out you know, early access builds and give feedback and help shape the direction that the technology ultimately takes. Um, and you know, we've worked on Java over the years in sort of lots of different, uh, you know, lots of different ways and different modes. But you know, this uh, has really enabled you know, my, my team at Oracle leading the development of these features to basically bring in and have a completely new level of transparency um, and get feedback earlier and make sure that the end result is something that's more stable and you know not something where we regret a bunch of things because we've gotten to encounter a lot of the different kinds of edge cases out there. That's you know you're you're touching upon something that uh, many developers have uh, been asking about as well, which is that notion of participation, which we'll get to. But uh, one of the facets of, of what you just discussed is the pace of innovation. And you know, ever since we've released the uh, six-month release cadence, what has that done to actually uh, make uh, innovation more approachable but also more stable? Chad, do you have any perspective on that? Well, I mean, it really comes back down to that uh, release cycle for you know, trust, innovation, and predictability. Um, we're very transparent and open. As George said, all of the conversations about how features are designed all happen in the open. You can actually follow them from inception all the way through creation and, and release. Um, and so having that predictable release cadence of every six months, we get this steady stream of new features. But you know, as Aurelia was also talking about, it's an incredible amount of work to make sure that they're not disruptive. And so you want to make sure that we're releasing great new features to address tomorrow's challenges, but do that in a way that feels like Java to gain the trust of the community over time. And that's worked incredibly well. And this is the 10th release uh, under the six month release kit. And so that's a big milestone. Uh, so it's exciting times for Java. Definitely. And so speaking of that that 10th release of, of Java as part of the six month release cadence, that's all about Java 19, which mm -hmm. you know, is now available. Developers can, can get it uh, immediately. And earlier, how about highlighting some of uh, the key features uh, in, in Java 19? and what projects do they map back to as part of OpenJDK? Sure, so Java um, 19 delivers seven JDK enhancement proposals. Six of them are either preview or incubator. Uh, two come from Project Amber. You have record patterns and pattern matching, which to me at least, they start to show the grand plan between what was previously what previously seemed to be the, some disconnected features, right? We had uh, the first preview of records in JDK 14, and also the first preview of pattern matching. Now you see the two of them combined. Uh, likewise, pattern uh, switch came out in JDK 12, and now you see how um, you have um, switch statements getting even more powerful. Then we have from Project Panama, the fourth incubator of the Vector API, which allows developers to write code that can be, can be, be translated into more efficient um, instructions that take advantage of modern processors. We have as well the foreign function and memory APIs that have gone from incubator to their first preview. So, that takes us just another step closer to getting those into the release. And I guess it clarifies for some people where the, what the flow is between incubator and previews. However, the most anticipated set of features in JDK 19 are undoubtedly the first previews from Project Loom. So Project Loom aims to rewrite the concurrency model in the JDK in a way that will allow you to write applications that will take advantage of all of the resources in your system. And again, in a seamless manner, there's a lot of work going on in previous releases that will make it so that for most developers, adapting Loom will just be a matter of switching from 
regular threads to virtual threads. And all the magic will happen behind the scenes. This is a preview feature. So, you know, like, don't, don't, don't think you can go ahead and, and get this started. But given that this started in 2017, and until now we've only got some early access builds, at least I am very excited. I know that if history repeats itself, putting it in, the, in a feature release means we're going to start getting a lot of very valuable feedback from developers. And that just brings the time when we get these in a final mode so much closer. I mean, you can taste it now. <laughs> right, and, and that's one of the advantages of providing features via preview because it's all about ensuring we're getting the feedback to ensure there's a quality uh, component to this when it finally reaches that general availability status. Yes, it's, it's amazing how much better things happen now that we get the chance to try these things out because these are features that once they're in the platform, as I said, they're solid, they're not gonna change and they're gonna be with us for decades. So getting it 95% right feels wrong if you play it in the long run. Right. The option of letting developers play with it, give us feedback and keeping just the details a little bit out and then solidifying them after having them be used, it has made a tremendous difference not just for our development team that doesn't have to stress to get it just perfect every single time, but also for the end result, right? It's, it's just, it's a different world. So, you know, we've learned a little bit about uh, the many features that have been, uh, that are being introduced in Java 19, but there's a whole catalog of projects that are happening in, in OpenJDK. George, do you have any favorites that come to mind and what kind of problems do they solve? Oh, there, there are a great number. Um, you know, we already had mentioned some of the ones that have delivered into 19, um, but I also like some of the ones that we've had uh, that have, have, you know, revolutionized uh, the capability, for instance, for memory management with the uh, ZGC project. Um, I'm also looking forward to where things are headed uh, on the Leiden project, looking at um, the trade-offs between the dynamic capabilities of Java and the ability to produce um, you know, more static behavior that can be taken advantage of in optimization for better startup and warm up. And all of this while we're leading Java forward also takes commitment from developers and other enterprises. Um, how does that role play into every release of Java? Well, that, that's certainly something that we care about a lot. We, uh, you know, both listen to um, you know, developers out there in terms of what they would like to see. Um, and we also talk with the, you know, thousands and thousands of enterprise customers that we have, um, both in terms of, you know, the challenges that they have for their workloads today, but also where, you know, what they would like to be able to do with Java in the future. Now you, you mentioned customers, which is, a, which is an interesting point too, because we always want to offer choice. We know there's tens of thousands of companies, millions of developers, whether they're small, medium, or large, their needs around Java are going to be different, whether it's something that's free and accessible or something where they need to rely on something a bit more uh, secure. So really, can you expand a little bit in terms of the Java SE subscription, which we uh, made available just a few years ago? Absolutely. So Java SE subscription is a way of making sure that Java users, be it developers or system administrators, uh, have the tools and the options that they need to make smart choices, right? You want developers to have access to new functionality, while at the same time, you want system administrators that, I don't want to run anything new, I just want the same thing that I had running before to continue to run and just you know keep up with security updates, keep up with improving hardware, but I don't need anything new, I just cared about stability. We have these two conflicting goals. And the way that we try to thread the needle is we want to make sure that new releases come up with new functionality, new capabilities. It's easier to write new code. While at the same time, we want to let somebody that wants to just run on old code continue to get updates to that old release without any new features, without any new functionality, other than the minimum required to keep it up and running for blocks of time of about eight years, which is usually longer than the time that most applications are around. And by having a subscription, we, we can afford to do that, right? We make the latest releases available to everybody, just grab them, use them, put them in production. 
um, after a release has been out, as an, after an LTS release has been out for three years, we say, okay, at this point, it's going to go into just this sustaining mode. If you have a subscription, you can continue applying those updates for the next uh, five years after that. You also have access to the support engineers that work with the people that actually wrote the platform. So that's pretty nice. So basically getting to getting access from the person who's responsible for making this technology accessible to you. Right. So tapping into this huge fountain of knowledge of Java, right? And we have also additional tools like Java Management Service that will provide additional capabilities that are needed if you have Java at a very large scale. So you know, if there's like three people in your company, you can do things manually. If you want to try that in 100,000 uh, systems, you're going to need some tooling. Going to need some tooling. And what if you're a, a cloud customer? Um, how do you get access to Java? Well, you have, of course, two choices. You can be in the Oracle Cloud. And in that case, you are covered. All of the Java IC subscription benefits are automatically given to you at no additional cost. But if you just haven't made the jump yet to the best cloud, and if you're using some other cloud, you can also get the benefits uh, of the Java IC subscription by purchasing the subscription directly. Right. So uh, that uniqueness in terms of choice continues to be a foundation for Java. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that choice is also participation. And you know, we've sort of touched upon it a little bit here and there uh, in today's conversation, but the power of community. You know, we talked about our leadership in terms of technology, but stewardship of the community has uh, been you know, part of the fiber of what Java has represented for, for over a, a quarter of a century. Um, what's your perspective on community, Chad, and why is it so important to the next 25 years and beyond for Java? This is the perfect opportunity to share a stat that's been in my head. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> the Open JDK community, uh, in the last 30 days, there's been 888 commits across 171 authors. So that's strong. In that's what keeps one. Yeah, in the last 30 days wow. to the JDK project, so uh, github.com slash openjdk slash JDK, uh, to all branches. Uh, pretty incredible. I mean, I, I actually just checked because we were coming into this and 171 authors in the last 30 days. So that's a powerful community that works on Java for you know the rest of the world to use. But in terms of uh, you know the larger breadth of community, it's incredibly important because as a developer, you're not just developing in an echo chamber. You don't you know just go into a room and build something all on your own. You're working with others. You're working with not only uh, learning material. You learn to program by watching and standing on the shoulders of others. You're using libraries and frameworks that are built by others. Um, you're working on teams that are working on software together, and that's incredibly important to build. A, a sustainable community and a large community with the breadth that brings you know a lot of value to developers and that's one of the strongest points of Java's 27 years global community every language on the planet is covered by let's say a Java user group or some other organization that that is uh, focused on Java I, I came prepared with stats as well so uh, something <laughs> that uh, is I'm really happy to announce is we've also reached our one millionth get this right one millionth Java certification completed. That means there are one million uh, Java certified developers on this planet that businesses can go after for, for hiring opportunities. None of you hopefully are, are leaving, um, <laughs> but uh, that's, pretty, uh, that's a pretty powerful stat. One million certified Java developers that are, that are, that are out there. Um, so you, you touched upon the power of community. What, what are some of the um, important programs that have kept the, the ecosystem so viable for so long? Well, uh, there's the longstanding programs like the Java Champions program, which are outstanding members of the community that have been recognized for their contributions to Java. Um, I'd like to recognize the new uh, members and welcome them to the Java Champions program. Uh, there's the Java User Group program, which I mentioned before is uh, 300 plus active global um, groups that are dedicated to Java. Many of them um, talk about Java in their local languages. Um, and so it's very sort of globally inclusive. Right. Um, and then, of course, we've been talking about the Java Day series, um, which is a new, well, actually, it, we're bringing back the Java Day series, which we <laughs> talked about. And uh, we've went and done some of those. So, for example, we've done Java Day at the uh, Paris Jug, uh, Java Day at um, Hamburg in Germany, and, or is it Hamburg in Germany? Yeah, sorry. And, um, oh gosh, Karlsruhe. 
Karlsruhe? Uh, Karlsruhe. Nikolai, Nikolai's going to kill me. <laughs> we, have to, we have to get the pronunciation right well, here. Well, I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> right. I think it's more like Karlsruhe. Karlsruhe. Uh, <laughs> yes. So uh, those three Java days have happened. We've had uh, dozens of speakers across them and, uh, and hundreds of, of attendees, all in their local languages, so German and, and, uh, and French. And then we have one upcoming in Java Day, Guadalajara, so GDL. I think and someone on this panel is going. Who's going to Guadalajara? Who might be going? Oh. Guadalajara. Oh, there you go. Right. <laughs> I got to work on this. There you go. <laughs> uh, and, and so uh, as we go reach in back into the community, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of new programs that are being invested in as well. Can you expand on some of the new programs that your team is, is chartering forward? Yeah, so we have, of course, dev.java, which is the website for everything Java. That's the URL, dev.java. Uh, Inside.java, an aggregate of content that's produced by folks that work on the platform itself. Um, and I think this is actually an incredibly important point because as a developer, when you use features, you not only want to read the documentation, but it's good to know what the nuances of uh, are of that particular feature. What is the intent of it? Why was it created? What's the vision behind it? And to get a sense of that, you tap into the knowledge of all the folks that work on Java. Um, it's a pretty powerful place to get information. Um, and then we, of course, have our YouTube channel. So youtube.com slash Java, putting a lot of investment into the, into, the, uh, into the shows there, the Inside Java podcast. Then we have some new ones, the Inside Java newsletter, uh, which is an aggregate of the aggregate of Inside.java, which is delivered <laughs> to your inbox monthly. Uh, and then the Duke's Corner podcast from Jim Grisanzio. So more of a community-focused podcast that you can find wherever you listen to uh, podcast episodes. You know, what, I, what I found is, you know, that's a long laundry list of programs <laughs> and channels and communication. But with over, you know, 10 million plus developers, we all have a preference in terms of how to be reached, how to stay connected. And it's important that we uh, find the most valuable uh, connections or channels to reach as many developers as possible. So. You know, that's a that's a pretty powerful list. Are there any specific programs that really re resonate with you, George? I mean, you've you've been one of the uh, you know uh, most long standing members of the Java team, which is great. You know, I, I'm following <laughs> in. Well, you know, I kind of got you beat there, but you know, you you uh, you have a lot of history and perspective in terms of power of community. What what's meaningful to you? So I, I've really enjoyed the sort of ongoing series of videos that Chad was mentioning, and I've liked the way there's been sort of a variety of sort of longer deep dives, um, as well as some of the shorter, you know, more TikTok type style of videos that, you know, just kind of look at something really quickly and give you a little bit of insight into it. Um, those I think have been really useful. And then, you know, for me, another thing that's a really um, amazing resource is when you go and look at some of the projects that, you know, we're leading in OpenJDK, um, many of them uh, publish uh, effectively white papers, a sort of, you know, state of the, you know, mm -hmm. state of the loom, state of the amber, you know, different things like that, state of Valhalla even, right? Talking about where are these projects? What have they done? What are they currently exploring? What are the next set of questions that they're going to look at? Um, and, you know, as Chad was saying, this is the kind of thing that gives you, you know, not only insight into what is something that's already there, but also why is it there and where is it headed? And, you know, finding that out directly from the people who are, are making it is a, an amazing thing to be able to do. Well, I, I hope you have your passport ready because it seems as though you're constantly being asked for uh, as a speaker on many of those Java days. So um, uh, get your plane tickets ready, I suppose, George. Uh, <laughs> it's good to be in demand. Um, Chad, so you're investing in some new areas and you have some new people coming on board. Uh, can you explore a little bit of that? Yeah. Um, so one of the big areas we're focusing on is uh, Java and education. Um, so we have a new hire, Heather Stevens. Welcome, Heather. Uh, we're really excited to have her. She's really focused on ensuring that Java is the language that uh, both teachers and students are thinking about using in the next uh, generation of developers. So really putting Java back in the forefront of, of education. And then um, Ana Maria Mihalciano, uh, hopefully I said that right. Um, Anna, welcome to the team. Uh, she just joined as part of the advocacy team along with Billy and Dennis and David and Jose and Nikolai and did I get everybody? Yeah. And Jim. So. And Jim, yes. And Jim. And Jim. Um, we welcomed Jim last time. So we're growing the team. George obviously has lots of hires in the uh, Java platform group. So if you're looking to work with Java um, in one of the best teams around, then uh, check out inside.java slash jobs. So, you know, uh, a lot of the questions that we've been getting over the six months all three of you covered really well, so I appreciate your time. But 
I'd really like to close on uh, your own personal memories. You know, let maybe we start with you, Aurelio. What is your most um, memorable Java memory uh, that you can recall? Oh boy, I guess. <laughs> Well, the one that sticks to mind was uh, JDK Open uh, Java 1 2016, where I got my uh, Rockstar Award. That was pretty <laughs> sweet. Uh, I tell you, the, the best thing that I see now in Java is the transformation that has happened now that we have these JEPs written up in the open. I, I got to confess a little something. It's made my job so much easier. <laughs> All I have to do now is go and read those things, mm -hmm. you know, learn the highlights of it. it. It used to be that all of that information was hidden. Now it's just so open. It's refreshing. I get questions and I look up the answers in the in the uh, descriptions. Not not just the descriptions, but the aliases right. when they ask why wasn't it done this way. You know, I'm no. I'm not stumped anymore <laughs> so because I, I it's always there. The, the takeaway I got is your job is easier and we need to make it harder. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Chad, what's, what's your fondest Java memory? Java Day Tokyo. Everybody knows this story. <laughs> Actually, it's one of the reasons that I'm on the team. So I had joined Oracle as part of a different organization. Um, and I was looking around to see what I wanted to do next. Uh, we were on stage together. I think most of us here. Uh, and uh, I barely knew you guys, and I was in part of the keynote for Java Day Tokyo. And this is a big Java Day. I mean, there was probably how many attendees there? Almost 2,000. <laughs> and uh, so part of the keynote, and uh, we're in a different time zone, and I wake up, and there's like 45 minutes until we're supposed to go on stage, and I'm 45 minutes across town. And <laughs> in Tokyo. I, in Tokyo. So I'm, even though I'm half Japanese, I'm very unfamiliar with the land. And so I thought I wasn't going to make it, so I called you, and you were... Steady. I know you now. You were not happy. <laughs> but I thought I was like, oh, you know, Shar's okay with it. I mean, he's so calm about it. I made it. I can't. I mean, it's actually kind of a miracle that I made it over. But that's my one of my favorite memories, John. That's, that's a good memory. Uh, you know, and I was always taught, uh, be a swan. Like regal <laughs> above water, but paddle as fast as you can below water. George, what's your fondest memory? Yeah, I think it uh, is probably back to when I was, uh, you know, had had joined the team before it was effectively even a part of Sun Microsystems, right? Um, you know, I joined in order to work on graphical user interface technology, um, and we basically came up with this idea of, you know, doing a, a new kind of GUI library, um, which uh, we someone came up with the name that it should be called Swing. Um, that's a whole another story. But when we were doing the sort of launch of the concept of this um, in the Java 1 keynote, I think it must have been in, gosh, when was that? 1996. 1997. Seven. I think it was. Yeah. Um, you know, we basically, um, you know, got together and and just like closed ourselves away for a, a couple of weeks. Um, James Gosling was, was helping us with that. And, you know, we built a effectively a prototype for Swing. That had all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, it had the first prototype of pluggable looks of look and feels, um, including a classical music look and feel, a jazz music look and feel, and the <laughs> look and feel. Um, so that was uh, that was good fun. Well, I'd like to thank you again for uh, joining us today. Remember, Java nineteen is available now. So download it. Start giving us your feedback on the preview uh, uh, features. Visit openjdk.org. Uh, and explore all of the projects that we're investing in that are delivering incremental value and innovation to you. Don't forget to also visit dev.java and inside.java to learn about all the various programs that we're bringing to the community to help accelerate your learning, as well as learning about all of the innovation from our own engineers. We look forward to seeing you again, either locally or at another uh, Oracle Java event uh, in the future. Thank you. Hello. In this session, we will review the largest changes delivered as part of JDK 19, the most recent release of the Java platform. JDK 19 is the second release of 2022 and the 11th release since we switched to a semi-annual release cadence. JDK 19 replaces JDK 18 and will be superseded by JDK 20 in March of 2023. 
The next LTS release is JDK 21, due out in September of 2023. JDK 19 is released under the no fee terms and conditions, so everyone can use it in production at no cost. JDK 19 brings us seven JDK enhancement proposals. It will be a preview rich release with six of those JEPs delivering either incubators or preview features. There are two JEPs with language features from Project Amber, two with library enhancements from Project Panama, and the first set of preview features from Project Loom, which aims at making it easier to write multi-threaded applications that properly utilize available resources. Lastly, the only non-preview or incubator JEP is a port to Linux RISC-V. Let's look into each one of these JEPs. Pattern Matching for Switch builds up on the work started in JDK 14 with the changes to the switch statement and pattern matching for instance off from JDK 16. This JEP brings those two together and introduces pattern matching into switch statements and expressions. Let's see an example. Switch statements used to work only on a few types, numeric, enum, and string. With switch expressions, we introduced other case labels but you still couldn't use a switch statement to test expressions against multiple patterns. Until JDK 19, we still would have had to chain a bunch of else if statements. Using pattern matching in a switch expression, we can make this clearer. And as a bonus, this code is optimizable by the compiler. Remember that the case statement has to be exhaustive. So in most cases, you want to add a default value. Notice that you can also now add a test for null as another case, making the code even easier to read and maintain. To maintain backward compatibility, the default label does not match a null selector. After a successful pattern match, we often need further tests, which can lead to cumbersome code like this. We can improve readability if the pattern supported a combination of pattern and boolean expressions. So, Allowing when clauses in switch blocks allows us to write these in a cleaner way. The first case matches the strings of length one, and all other strings are caught by the second case. The when clause can use any pattern variables declared by the pattern in the case label. In earlier previews of pattern matching, rather than when, we used the short circuit and operator, that's the double ampersand. But that became confusing if the expression used Boolean operators. So in this preview, this was chained to use the win keyword. There are a couple of new gotchas that arise with pattern matching for switch. The first one is that pattern could dominate later patterns. It is possible to have an expression that matches multiple labels in a switch block. This is allowed, but they must be placed in the right order. Here, we have code very similar to what I just showed you, but with the order of the case statements reversed. Since the first label will catch all strings, including strings of length one, the second label is never reached. It is dominated by an earlier case. This will result in a compile time error. This is one area that has received some improvements from the first preview in JDK 17. Constant labels now have to appear before a gathered pattern of the same type. Another new possible error is to have fall through when declaring a pattern variable. In this example, if the variable was a character, it would print character, but then, as there is no break statement, execution would flow to the next case label. And since the variable i declared in the second pattern would not have been initialized, we would get an error. It is therefore a compile time error to allow flow through to a case that declares a pattern. Falling through a label that doesn't declare a pattern is fine. The next JEP in our list, Record Patterns Preview, also merges functionality from two prior enhancements. It allows the use of records and pattern matching, both of which were introduced in JDK 16. Let's look at this example. The pattern variable P is used here solely to invoke the accessor methods X and Y. It would be better if the pattern could not only test whether a value is an instance of point, but also extract the X and Y components from the value directly. In this example, point integer X integer Y is a record pattern. 
it lifts the declaration of local variables for extracted components into the pattern itself and it initializes those variables with the right values from the past object. The true power of pattern matching is that it scales elegantly to much more complicated object graphs. For example, consider the following declarations. Let's make the point more complicated. We introduce a color. Then we define a color point as a point and a color. And finally, a rectangle is defined by two color points. We know we can extract the components of an object with a record pattern. If we want to extract the color from the upper left point, we could write, but the color point for the upper left is also a record, which we can decompose further with nested record patterns. Using nested patterns, we can decompose the outer and inner records at the same time. A record pattern can use var to match against the record component without stating the type of the component. Note that the names of the pattern variables do not have to be the same as the names of the record components. Foreign Function Memory API incubated in JDK 17 and JDK 18. This jet promotes those APIs from incubator to preview features. This also illustrates the relationship between incubators and previews. These APIs make it much easier and safer to have Java code interoperate with C libraries. The goal of these APIs are to eventually replace the existing Java native interface with something that is better in terms of lower complexity, superior or equivalent performance, and to grant access to foreign functions written in other languages besides C. This last part is not yet there in the preview. These APIs won't lock developers out of unsafe operations, but they will be better at warning them when they're doing something potentially unsafe. Vector computations allow systems to execute operations on vectors instead of applying the same operation to several values one at a time. This can result in significant performance improvements. Hotspot supports auto-vectorization so sometimes it can detect when scalar operations can be transformed into super word operations and mapped to vector instructions. The set of transformable operations, however, is limited and fragile to changes in the code shape. This API will make it possible to write complex vector algorithms in Java in a way that it's far more predictable and robust. Here's a conceptual model of a vector operation. Instead of needing to repeat operations, we can achieve the same result with a single pass. As everyone who reads random Wikipedia technical articles for fun knows, Galois counter mode is a mode of operation for symmetric key cryptography, block ciphers, widely adopted for its performance. Those that know the ins and outs of these algorithms, and I'm not one of them, notice that this particular one could be improved by using vector instructions. Starting with JDK 18, when Vector API was in its third incubator, we did precisely that. Use the Vector API in the security libraries that computes AES JCM. In case you're wondering if it's okay to rely on a preview or incubator API, it is okay only if you are committed to updating your code with any change to the preview in later versions. And we are, so it's all good. Risk five. This is an open source risk instruction set architecture. It is supported by many languages, many tool chains, and RISC V hardware is becoming more common. Moving the port of RISC V to the OpenJDK mainline does not imply that any vendor will provide RISC V ports as part of the Java offering. You will see in later slides, when I show you what operating systems and architecture oracles will provide JDK 19 for, that we do not plan to have RISC V offerings yet. What this JEP means though, is that whenever a vendor decides to support RISC V, it will be easier, and more importantly, that this architecture will be taken into account when designing and implementing new features. The last two JEPs in our list are the first previews that arrive into the JDK from Project Loom. For those that haven't seen any of the Project Loom presentations, Project Loom aims to, make the, to revamp the Java concurrency model so that it can meet the needs of today's high-end, high-scale server applications. Why did we need Loom? Even from the first release of Java, 
the platform has allowed for written concurrent code using a very straightforward model. Java Threads, when first introduced, allow for a platform-independent way to write concurrent code. Without Java, developers who wanted to have different tasks running on different threads often had to deal with platform-specific code. Java provided a nice layer of abstraction that let developers use Java threads, which would then magically be converted to operating system threads for each of the supported operating systems. There is a lot of great things about these threads. They offer a natural programming model with readable sequential code using control flow operators that users understand, loops, conditionals, exceptions. Users get great debugging and serviceability and readable stack traces. And threads are a natural unit of scheduling for the OS. Project Loom aims to retain all of those advantages. The problem is that the implementation of threads by the OS is too heavyweight. It takes too long to start a thread. But worse, the number of threads that the OS can support at any time is limited by the number limits the number of concurrent transactions that a server can handle. Now, if you're using threads to service operations that spend a relatively large amount of time waiting for resources, for example, if you have a server handling requests that come through a network, the limit in the number of threads can severely limit your application to well below the capacity of the hardware or the network. And so threads become a severe constraining factor on server throughput. One option to deal with this limit is to turn into the reactive frameworks. By not representing concurrent operations directly as thread, we can scale well beyond the limits posed by the thread per request model, but at a very huge cost. It is much more complicated than, and, and, and it's harder to write, it's harder to read, and it's much harder to debug or profile because the platform in all of its layers and all of its tools is built around threads. Reactive may be the best that people can do with the current JVM, but Loom's goal is to do better, which we can do by making threads lighter and more scalable, letting people keep using their simpler models and toolings that they have been using for years, but gaining a lot of performance. From a user perspective, Loom has almost no new APIs. The main new runtime construct is virtual threads, which shares today's threads APIs and semantics. But they're implemented differently from existing platform threads. Rather than being tied to an OS thread and carrying around a big contiguous stack, virtual threads store their stack in the heap in the form of defined delimited continuations. Sorry. A virtual thread has a couple of hundred bytes of metadata, starts up much faster than a platform thread, and uses only as much stack space as is actually needed for the active stack frames. As a result, we can create many more virtual threads than we can platform threads. When a virtual thread has work to do, the JVM assigns it to an OS carrier thread until it reaches a point where it would normally wait for some resource. The JVM will then move that virtual thread out of the carrier thread and place instead some other virtual thread that is ready to get work done. When the resource that the thread was working for responds, the thread can be allocated to some other carrier operating sister thread. It could be the same carrier thread or a different one. It really doesn't matter. The whole scheduling of the virtual threads to carrier OS threads is handled by the JVM. As a developer, I don't need to worry about it. I can write code like I did before and let the JVM figure out when to have one, one of the virtual threads running, when to pause it, and when and how to bring it back to more work. Because the real Java threads and not some other abstraction, existing code and tools that use the Threads API just works when running on virtual threads. They work with Thread Local, they give you the same stack traces and thread dumps, and they work with the same debugger and profiling tools. This graph shows Jetty configured with 200 and 800 threads using a task which has a 100 millisecond uh, IO bound service latency. As little laws will predict, we see in the darker blue line that the server handles the load fine until we push the requests per second above about 10 times the number of threads, at which point latency becomes terrible since the arrival rate exceeds the service rate and requests start queuing up in socket layer and then eventually they start being rejected. But at that point where the server becomes overloaded, we still have plenty of CPU headroom. 
On the lighter blue line, we can see that we can postpone the time when requests start to get rejected by letting the JVM create more platform threads. But if we continue simply adding platform threads, which requires so much memory, even if they're not using it, we would run out of memory long before we could approach the point where the CPU is being properly utilized. The green light is the graph that shows the same workload running with Loom and using virtual threads per HTTP request. Now we can continue to scale until we reach full CPU utilization. The graph doesn't show that point because we had a hard time generating enough load. If you had workloads that are already using all the CPU, then Loom wouldn't make that much of a difference. But in most cases, when you use threads, the, the bottleneck is the number of OS threads that is currently capped by memory. In those cases, Loom can remove that bottleneck and let you scale the number of threads until you are limited by the number of cores. As part of the work to test Loom, a small group of people from the Helinum team, and by small I mean one person full-time and one person part-time, worked to create a prototype replacement for Netty, which they called Warp. Netty is used to create high-performance protocol servers and clients. To allow for optimal resource utilization, Netty doesn't use the simple paradigm of one Java thread per request but instead it has its own set of APIs to allow multiple requests to timeshare the same OS threads. Netty is a mature product, actively maintained since 2004, so it has about 18 years worth of hard work and optimizations. Using Loom and dumb synchronous code, some tuning, the Helidon team was able to get similar or better performance to Netty in just six weeks. And perhaps more importantly, the code for Warp is much easier to read, maintain, and debug. We got a nice quote here from Thomas Longer from Project Helidon, how they never encounter some of the problems that they had expected to run into. A great deal of the work of Loom had nothing to do with stack swapping magic, but in clearing roadblocks in the JDK to make it all work smoothly. This meant finding all the places in the JDK where blocking might happen and replace it with logic that, if running on virtual threads, would instead pause the virtual thread and free up the carrier thread. Much of this was undertaken in separate JEPs, where individual JDK components were re-implemented and they were put into JDK 13, 15, and 18. This had the extra benefit of not only making these mechanisms loom ready, but it cleared up a bunch of technical debt on some whole code. In the end, Loom made almost no significant changes to the JDK APIs, except for the new Structured Concurrency API. Instead, it provides better implementation of existing and familiar abstractions. We've been working on Project Loom since late 2017. We had a prototype of the core feature then called Fibers, now called Virtual Threads, in the first 18 months. But as usual, most of the work of getting to a production quality release was not in the core feature itself, but in the things adjacent to it. It took several iterations to get the performance where we wanted, and much of the work was rewriting the implementation of Java's old IO subsystems to eliminate blocking and getting the debugging experience just right. Some of these improvements have shipped already as part of separate JEPs. JEP 425 introduces virtual threads as a preview features to the platform. For most developers, Switching to virtual threads will simply require switching from platform threads to virtual threads. But there are two scenarios in which virtual threads cannot be unmounted during blocking operations because it's pinned to the carrier. One, when it executes code inside a synchronized block or method. And two, when it executes a native method or a foreign function. The Java team has taken care of updating most of the code that, uh, that, that, that did this within the libraries. In some cases, however, your own code might still have some of these issues. The new APIs give you the right tools to update your code so that it can play nicely with virtual threads, but you still need to find out the right places to update. To help you with this, a JDK fly recorder event is emitted now when a thread blocks while pinned. The system property JDK trace pin threads triggers a stack trace when a thread blocks while pinned, running uh, with uh, dash djdk dot trace pin threads equals full prints a complete stack uh, when a thread blocks while pinned with the native frames and frames holding uh, monitors highlighted. 
running with uh, dash djdk dot trace pin threads equals short limits the output to just the problematic frames. JDK19 also delivers APIs for structured concurrency. It is a relatively new idea in its current form, but it wasn't ours. The Loom team found it in a blog post that it's of the rare kind that makes them go, obviously this is how things should work. The principle is simple. When sequential code splits into concurrent flows, they must join back in the same code unit. But the implications are profound. Just as a structured programming codified best practices into the language for sequential code, structured concurrency does the same for concurrent code. Many of the most complicated parts of uh, Brian Getz's book, such as those on shutdown and cancellation, just go away. Structured concurrency codifies these best practices of propagating failure and cancellation into the API so that they can be done so that they cannot be done incorrectly as well as expresses their relationship in a way that the runtime can understand and recreate the structure in the, structure, in the structured thread dump. Because it follows a discipline of waiting for child tasks, some of the most error-prone aspects, such as cancellation and shutdown, are made dramatically simpler. And this brings us to the end of the JEPS in JDK19. Let's view some of the other details of the release. Where can you get it? You can download JDK19 from the Java site in Oracle's website, where you will find links to the current updates for 17, 11, and 8, as well as JDK19. You can also download these releases under the no fee terms and conditions using curls or wget. The URLs for those releases can be constructed by specifying the version, operating system, architecture, and packaging format. We have two different set of URLs. One has latest in the path and will get you the current version, whatever it happens to be at the time when you request it. The file name on the current version is just the feature number rather than the full version. So for example, you can ask for JDK 17 instead of having to say 1704. The archive URLs have archive in the name and have the full version. For all of the URLs, you can get a checksum by adding a dot SHA-256 to the download URL. As you would expect, JDK19 supports the same operating systems as previous JDK versions, but we also add some of the newer updates like Oracle Linux 9 and Mac OS 13. For Linux and Mac OS, we support x64 and ARM64. And as usual, the best place to learn more about any of these features is openjdk.org where you will find the complete list of all of the JD, uh, of all of the JEPs. And it also includes most of the text that, from which I got the information for this session. I hope you found this information useful. I invite you to download and use JDK19. If you do try out any of the preview features or incubators, we would really appreciate you letting us know how it goes. Each JEP has a link to the correct email alias for where to submit your feedback. Thank you.